Well, good morning. A new year is upon us. What will it bring? We'll have to wait to see what 2018 has in store for us. One thing for certain, it will be a big political year in Michigan. We'll talk more about that right now. From TV6, this is The Ryan Report. Here's your host, Don Ryan. Well, Brian Kelly was born in Dearborn, Michigan and graduated from Ionia High School. He began a career in community banking and also served as an Ionia County Commissioner. He entered state politics in 2006, winning election to the Michigan House of Representatives, where he served two terms. His legislative service ended when Rick Snyder selected him as his running mate in 2010, and they went on to win that election. Re-elected in 2014, he is now in the final year of his second term as Lieutenant Governor of Michigan. Lieutenant Governor Kelly is our guest this morning. Welcome to the Ryan Report. Great to be with you. Thanks for having nice me. Nice to have you with us. I know you're here on official business, and, and it's, not, uh, it's not a happy occasion. Yeah, I'm here to pay respects to Mayor Baldini, and what a huge loss in, in, to, a, to a community and a, a model of public service, the way that it ought to be done. A person who works across the aisle, across generations, across levels of government and philanthropic work and just the, the impact, what a gaping hole that that leaves. But the best w way to carry on that legacy is to carry on the work, to believe in this area as much as he believed in this area, to, to be about building bridges and bringing people together, particularly in a time when there's intense divide in our political system. You know, and, and Tom was a died in the wool Democrat, but he was also the kind that could sit down and talk with anybody. You know, it was it was kind of an old school uh, where, where people from political parties didn't uh, fight with each other all the time. You know, when we when we first uh, pulled together for the administration for our administration, uh, groups of people to help work on things. One of the one of the first initiatives was to take a more regional approach to things, creating these regional prosperity zones. And um, and Tom was one of the one of the people that one of the first calls that our uh, strategy department made because he had worked so uh, so well on, on just making things happen, bringing people together, development of talent, and, and the number of lives that he touched is just extraordinary. He will be missed for certain. Um, let's talk about some of the things happening in Lansing, and certainly most recently you signed a package of bills having to do with the opioid crisis, and I think crisis is the right word, isn't it? It is. It's an emergency, and it needs to be treated that way. Uh, we are now seeing overdoses, overdoses claim more lives every year than car accidents, both nationwide and here in Michigan. It's an epidemic that has swept across every single corner of our state, and that's why it needs to be treated like an emergency. A few years ago, I chaired the Prescription Drug and Opioid uh, Abuse Task Force, and we put out a roadmap on how to stem, turn around, and, and hopefully eliminate this epidemic. And several of those recommendations have been, have been implemented already. Last week, though, we took a huge step forward, and it's in the area of prevention and earlier detection of addiction. Of course, we need to help people that have already become addicted and things have already gone horribly wrong in their lives and in communities, but the most important thing that we can do is prevent people from becoming addicted in the first place. And that's why I'm so excited about this work that's happening now. I think this is really how to turn it around. And you know, in, in this case, in, in many instances, these are people who probably started out by, by thinking they were doing the right thing. They, they, they aren't recreational drug users to begin with. During this decade, we can say that most people, over half, that are addicted to heroin started on prescription drugs. And, this, and so this is something that we really, we, we need to, to take a long, hard look of, at, at every aspect of the way that people become addicted and, uh, in, in to and to prevent it from happening in the first place. Because you, you would, without the, the education about how dangerous these things are, some people just think, well, you know, I got a prescription for my doctor. As long as I take it as prescribed, right. it's, it's not risky. But you, the thing about opioids, you can take it exactly as prescribed. Not, not to take any more than was given to you and on any, and a different rate than it was given to you and still become addicted. It can still take everything in your life and what's important to you. So we need to make sure that we, we make patients partners in their own pain management. And, and one of the things that this bill package does 
It requires that patients be given information about the dangers of these drugs be when they're prescribed so that uh, so that they can choose, you know what, I'd rather take a less risky option or at least they know the dangers and can limit that risk going in. And also for schools to get more engaged in helping kids understand these dangers. And, and these bills also put some new requirements on doctors prescribing opioids, don't they? It, yeah, there are a couple, of, a couple of really important aspects in the medical community, that which I want a, a shout out really to a lot of hospitals and doctors that are, that are really already aggressively uh, making changes so that they can uh, they can help people to to manage pain effectively, but with uh, without the risk of addiction. The um, one of the the centerpieces to this plan is a new Michigan Automated Prescription Service. We call it MAPS for short. It's to give doctors access to the entire prescription history of the person that they're dealing with to prevent doctor shopping, to identify addiction earlier. When, uh, when it has already occurred, and also to prevent pill diversion, where somebody's take, getting prescriptions to then turn around and sell them. This, is, uh, this system was installed previously. We scrapped the old one, put in a brand new one that's got rave reviews from the medical community and its ease of use and how fast it gets information back. We're now integrating it into electronic medical record systems to make it work even e uh, easier and have it more integrated into the practice. And with the bill package last week, it'll become universal that all doctors see this information before they make the prescription. So it's not gonna tell them whether or not they write this prescription, but it will make sure that they've got all the information before they make the decision. Very serious problem. Let's hope the solutions are a result of this legislation. Absolutely. More questions for you back in a couple of minutes after we take this break. Our guest this morning is Lieutenant Governor Brian Kelly, you know, before jumping back into politics and such, um, well, a little more background about you. You're a Michigan State grad, and then That's you right. went on to uh, Grand Valley and, and Harvard. You have to be happy with state's uh, performance in the athletic field. It really has been a, a great year. And while I, I love to see the success, the comeback of the football team, which flipped their record, they were three and nine before, and, and, uh, and, and just really turned it on this year and had a great, uh, a great season and a great bowl win, but now the basketball team being on top. And now that was right around the time when I was at Michigan State when that basketball program was taken off. So um, I love football, but it's really all about basketball course, for me. We love basketball here because Tom Izzo is a UP native. So. Yes, right. You know, uh, you're married, you have three children, I believe? Yes, uh, my, uh, my wife and I have three kids, and um, they are ages 13, 11, and seven, almost eight. So they're a handful, but they're, they're great. Very active kids, and uh, they teach me something every single day. And I, I know you've been uh, an advocate for autism awareness, and that's kind of a personal issue with you, isn't it? It, it is. I, uh, raising a daughter with autism, our middle child has autism, and she's amazing. She's really opened our eyes to both the potential in people with disabilities, but also um, the, uh, some of the shortfalls in the system. And, and as you might imagine, a person like me, um, you know, I have connections and resources that could, could make, you know, make sure that things turn out right for my daughter. But it was hard enough to where um, I, I, wanted, I wanted more people to have, uh, to have access to all the things that their family needed to be successful and it turned into advocacy for autism and then more broadly developmental disabilities than from their mental health um, issues and now I think of it as as health care from the neck up brain care it's okay. uh, when a person suffering from addiction or a developmental disability or a um, or a mental illness that uh, a lot of times they they're you know the world just doesn't work very well for them and I wanted to bring my life experience to the table to, to make it better for more people. And that brings to mind, you know, some people say we're probably not doing enough in Michigan. How do you, how do you react to that? Well, I would agree <laughs> that, um, that there is, there's so much more work that needs to be done. I've, I've started to focus on employment and education. Those two areas I think can make the biggest difference where it, when, you, when you have, uh, take for example with, with a developmental disability such as autism, when you provide a, a, a person, a child, with everything that they need to reach their full potential, a lot of, a lot of people could end up being uh, independent, living full and productive, self-determined lives. That's a, uh, that's, we need that outcome for more people. 
So having an education system that sees the potential and is equip equipped to really help them reach their potential is important. And then having a, a, uh, an employer base out there that sees the value in hiring people with disabilities. That this is, it's not charity, it's, it's, it's about people that have a lot to offer but oftentimes don't get the opportunity to, uh, to prove it. And so I've been on a mission to change that. And, uh, and while we've made a lot of progress, we have so much work to do. Let's, uh, sh let's shift gears. One of the things you were promoting was a part-time legislature. Right. Let me ask you a couple of questions that people who don't like that idea might say. Um, they would say that uh, legislators have really lost authority already because of term limits and putting more power in the hands of bureaucrats. So does that concern you? The job of legislating is making laws, and that no, whether you have year-round year lawmaking or you have lawmaking like most states do it in a limited period of time, it doesn't change the fact that the only ones who can pass laws are the legislators. So it's a matter of, uh, of, of having a period of time where you get in, get the important work done, go back home. What about, what about those who see their legislator as their contact with Lansing, their advocate? Much like a, a federal congressman. Sure. Yeah, the proposal doesn't mm -hmm. change any of that. So uh, I would expect that legislators would still have year-round year constituent services staff. That's a very small part of the overall operation, and the proposal doesn't change that in any way. Another uh, issue that's just come up with the passing of the uh, federal tax reform is the question of how that's going to affect Michigan's state income tax, and that right. people can now take a $4,000 uh, exemption based on, on the federal tax. Some people say that the state will have to do something. What, what's your take on all this? We do need to change our state income tax code to accommodate the changes that were made in the federal tax code. The, where the biggest, there's a, a handful of small changes or small impacts on the state tax base that could inadvertently cause uh, people's taxes to rise unless we make some changes. But there's one really big one, and the big one is the loss of the personal exemptions. What we'll need to do is to, is to make it clear in our tax code that even though most Americans will now file um, a, under the, um, the standard broad deduction. standard deduction, right. um, that, that doesn't mean that you, you can't claim a, an individual deduction on your state tax return. Right now it's $4,000. I think with the, all the changes together, it could maybe even go up a little more than $4,000. But we, we do need to change the state income tax code to make sure that people here at the state of Michigan can still claim their deductions even though they're going away at the federal level. Okay. I want to talk about your future, but let's just wait a minute. In fact, let's wait two minutes and take this break. I'll be back with more with Lieutenant Governor Kelly in just two minutes. Our guest this morning is Lieutenant Governor uh, Brian Kelly. Um, Governor Snyder is term limited, and so your joint terms will be ending. You've made it clear you'd like to be the next governor of Michigan. Why should people select you? We have come so far mm -hmm. in this state. Coming out of the last decade, we now have added a half a million new jobs. We see income rising at a top 10 rate. We've seen our unemployment hit a 17 year low and our population overall in the state has started to grow again. So we're on a comeback. Balanced budgets, paid down debt as well. We have net inbound migration of people for the first time in a long time. So our state is on the right track. What I'm doing now is running to keep the comeback going and then bring everything to the next level to build on this strong foundation and make Michigan literally the most prosperous state in all of America. Attorney General uh, Sh Schutte is thought probably to be your strongest competitor at this point. Some columnists have identified him as the Trump candidate and you as the Snyder candidate. How do you react to that? Well, I, I, I'll let him speak for himself, but okay. I'm, I'm the candidate for the people of the state of Michigan. I don't uh, choose to identify myself um, in, in any way outside of what I bring to the table. I'm very proud of the work that we've done in the Snyder administration to bring our state back. And, uh, and where we sit here in the Upper Peninsula has been a big piece of that Michigan comeback, but there's so much work to do. So to continue this comeback, why would we want to change directions? The, the, where we need to go now is to, is to make sure that our people are ready for all the opportunity that exists out there. There's huge demand for people out there in the, in the economy. And if our people have the skills that they need to be globally competitive, they will compete and win. The, uh, as you say, change directions, I was kind of vaguely familiar with this and then actually kind of look back on the records a little bit. And if you go back about 50 years, 
Republican Bill Milliken was elected in 68. Uh, he was followed by Democrat uh, Jim Blanchard, and he was followed by Republican John Engler, and he was followed by Democrat Jennifer Granholm, and she was followed by Republican Rick Snyder. You see, kind of see where this is going? Does that concern you? Well, there's a um, there's a, another important fact, though. If you look at all those administration changes, that in each case when it changed, our state was in a recession, and we're not going to be in a recession in 2018. Everything's going in the right direction. And so um, whether it was that uh, in, in the early 80s from Milliken to Blanchard, recession, and when, and when it was Blanchard to Engler, we were in a recession. When it was um, Engler to Granholm, recession again. And then, of course, Granholm to Snyder was in uh, almost a depression. And so uh, that's a fat, very big difference in what was occurring during those uh, time periods and what's happening today. Today in Michigan, we see economic growth. In fact, we see growth that is outpacing the size of our workforce. And, uh, and so that gives me a lot of confidence that the people of our state are going to see how far we've come and going to want to keep it going in that same direction. Okay, you, you raised that question of workforce, and, and that is a real issue in Michigan. We even see it, we, we see it here in the Upper Peninsula as well. I, is the state doing enough to train future generations of workers, both in terms of education and work training? There's been a lot done so far. We need to do a lot more in the future. That's why when I put out the, 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 the plan for the future and how to bring things to the next level, it's, it's, uh, it's having the best K-12 system in literally in the, in the country. It's having a pipeline for 100,000 more, uh, more skilled trades jobs just in the next four years. And then on top of that, to transform our social services to help people get back in the game, to, to remove barriers to employment and independence and get people back to work. That's the, the, the key here of, of the future and bringing our economy to the next level is making sure that we have the people that are required to accommodate all of that growth and opportunity that exists today. Be because of its history, Michigan kind of lagged behind other states in the number of college graduates. And are, are we doing enough in, in Michigan to support Higher education. Higher education has been um, has been um, on the incline over the last several years, and more people are seeking four-year degrees. But I just want to make sure that we don't present it as though that's the only post-high school option that a child has. Uh, when a person enters that workforce, there are all kinds of skilled trades opportunities and two-year degrees and apprenticeships that can make for a great living, or you could go to college, or you could join the military, or you could become an entrepreneur. There are so many different things that a person can do with their life. We just need to make sure our primary education is system is showing kids all the things that they could do, and then equipping them with what they need to go out there and chase their hopes and dreams and aspirations. And colleges and universities are a huge part of our future, but it's not, uh, we, we can't look at that as being the only option. The, the way I look at it is, so plumbers need accountants and accountants need plumbers. And, and who's to say one profession is higher than the other because one requires trade school and one requires college? I don't think that we should look at it that way. We should look at these as equally important to our economy and, and honorable professions that keep people can make a great life out of. Okay. It's going to be an interesting year in Michigan and politics. Just about everybody's up for election. So uh, thanks for coming in and starting off the new year with us to uh, give us some insights into what's happening. What a pleasure to be with you. Thank okay. you. I'll be back with some other thoughts for you after we take this break. Well, we've said goodbye to 2017, but let's take one more look back at some things of interest that happened during the past year. It was the year of the roundabout in Marquette. You know, 10 years ago, drivers had never encountered one in Upper Michigan. But this year, the city built six new ones to bring the total in Marquette to seven. The construction added to the consternation of many drivers and provided fodder for local comedians. I suggested maybe they should build a few more and go for a record. Speaking of records, it will be tough for NMU to top 2017 when it comes to getting the school's name out in front of a national audience. In March, Al Roker and the NBC Today Show came to Marquette to watch students set a Guinness World Record by playing the largest ever game of freeze tag at the Superior Dome. But that wasn't the school's only national exposure when it started a new class in medicinal plant chemistry, which quickly became known as the marijuana class. The story went global 
and also brought NBC News back to Marquette. After a year like this, I wonder what they have planned for the future. The Detroit Lions maintain their steady course. Yes, they missed the playoffs again. They now have one of the most expensive players in the NFL as quarterback Matthew Stafford signed a gigantic contract uh, this year. Yet they still had a mediocre season. And head coach Jim Caldwell, well, the Lions sent him packing. He's a nice guy, but he couldn't win the big games, and he was like your crotchety old uncle when it came to talking to the media and fans. It was a disappointing year for Green Bay Packer fans when Aaron Rodgers was knocked out of action for most of the season and the team failed to make the playoffs. It really underscores the role the quarterback has in any team's success. Between Brett Favre and Aaron Rodgers, the Packers have had a pretty successful 25-year run. Meantime, the Detroit Tigers hired a new manager and traded away most of their good players. Should be an interesting year ahead, he said with tongue-in-cheek. And one of the fun stories of 2017 involved a company in New York called TickPick, which sells tickets on the Internet. Their problem began when they published a map of the United States that did not include Upper Michigan. Not the first time this happened, but instead of an apology, a customer support team member responded, yeah, we got the important part of Michigan. Isn't that good enough? They also said, we're sure the Upper Peninsula is a lovely place to live, and I assure you we didn't intentionally leave it off the map, but seriously, it's just a bunch of forests. Well, seeing the error of the company's ways, the CEO, Brett Goldberg, not only apologized, but he got on, on an airplane, flew to Marquette, and offered to buy a beer for anyone who showed up to meet him at Black Rock's Brewery. Hundreds showed up that night, and one of the key parts of this story is that it all took place in one day. I know there's a lot more that happened around this place we call home, but that's it for this morning. I'll be back in a minute. Well, that's our show for this week. The Today Show is coming up next. You can also catch us on the Internet at UpperMichiganSource.com. Today's show will be available starting at about noon on Monday. Thanks to Lieutenant Governor Kelly for joining us today. Should be an interesting year ahead for politics in Michigan, and he is part of that story. And thank you for joining us. Let's, uh, let's make plans to get together again next Sunday morning.